Lewis, how are you? It's been a while, hasn't it? Do apolo apologise about that. Sort of been a lot going on in my life. Uh, I've been a bit lazy as well. And, uh, I've sort of got a lot of episodes that I have planned. I've got sort of stacks of records all over the place, but I didn't get around to it. So let's get back to it. And let's get back to it with a bang. Jazz, not just jazz, but Blue Note Records. Probably one of the sort of most, most iconic uh, record labels of all time, isn't it? With the sort of amazing photography, the, the, the graphics, and of course, above all, the sort of incredible music. I mean, what an amazing back catalogue they had. And you know, but a lot of stuff they sort of didn't even release. I mean, at the time, sort of world-class uh, sessions by the sort of uh, top players on their label. And they just sort of didn't put them out. And sort of they were that, the standards were sort of that high. It's sort of quite, quite incredible, really. But uh, um, anyway, I must, before I start, I've got to say that I'm sort of, I'm not, I'm not a jazz expert um, at all. I'm, I'm a sort of relative newcomer, really. I've only been listening to jazz for about nine or ten years. So it's not as easy for me to talk about jazz as it is about uh, all the kinds of metal or punk because I've been into those sort of all me, also almost all me life. So do bear with me, be nice to me, be kind, uh, because, um, well, I'll do my best. That's all I can promise. So what I did, it's about a month ago now, I sort of pulled out about 12 uh, Blue Note records off the shelf and uh, sort of thought, let's have a look at these 12 records and... I did shuffle them around a little bit, and they're not ranked or anything, but, uh, and people are going to probably say, what, oh, why has he sort of chosen, why has he chosen that one by that bloke and not that one, this, that, and the other, but don't worry, uh, there probably will be a part two, and if your favourite one sort of hasn't shown up, uh, don't worry, it will probably appear again at a later date. Now, I noticed after I pulled them all out that every record was between 1963 and 1970 nothing from the 50s nothing from the really really early 60s so i think you can sort of tell uh me tastes in jazz by just me saying that well let's get down to it to we first off mr ornette coleman from 1968 New York is now uh recorded at the same time as the love call sessions i chose this one uh, because I, I think the cover is a sort of most uh, blue notish uh, looking cover. I love this record, and it does get criticised a little bit. I've, I've sort of read because uh, people think that Elvin Jones didn't really sort of go well uh, with Ornette Coleman on this record. Don't know about that. I'm not an expert on those things. All I know is that me ears like this record uh, a lot, and of course. People are going to say, oh, why are you, you should have chosen uh, the sort of Golden Circle uh, live in Stockholm records. But maybe we'll get to them uh, next, uh, another uh, sort of another time. I thought I'd show this one because is it a little bit overlooked or underrated? Not sure. Either way, Ornette Coleman, 1968, uh, New York is now. I love the great uh, picture on the back sleeve too. Great record. Great, great record, Ornette Coleman. Wonderful. But Ornette Coleman, I do actually sort of prefer his uh, Atlantic Years stuff. And science fiction is my favourite uh, Ornette Coleman when he sort of he started to get do a lot of interesting stuff for me after he'd sort of left Blue Note and moved on. But uh, enough about that. Next, Don Cherry. Now, Don Cherry only made three records uh, for Blue Note, and for my money, this is the best one. Symphony for Improvisers. Quite amazing lineup on this record. Pharaoh Sanders is on it too. And the Argentinian Gato Barbieri, who really went downhill quickly, didn't he, in the late 70s, early 80s, but... He was a great player. He's got a lot of great records on, on Impulse and everything uh, from the late 60s. And even he had his first records on ESP, isn't it? So he was a real uh, fiery player back in the day. But this is definitely 
uh, my favourite uh, Don Cherry uh, record on the Blue Note, as I said, from 1966. Five record. I mean, Henry Grimes on the bass, heavy duty bass player. Amazing. This is, I'd say, because uh, Don Cherry can be a little bit tricky on the ears, kind of, but this one uh, is sort of quite an easy but fiery listen check it out great record next he only made one record for blue note and very sadly uh it came out not long uh before he died he's got an amazing sort of discography and uh, this is one of those records that people will be sort of like oh no it's too much for me uh can't get into it it's unlistenable it's no there's no tunes on it but I beg to differ, this record is a masterpiece. Eric Dolphy, Out to Lunch, uh, 1964. Uh, Bobby Hutchison on the Vibes, who is a sort of anchor for this record, is playing, playing is uh, absolutely incredible on this record. And got Freddie Hubbard on the trumpet, another sort of fiery player. But, uh, oh, you can see this is a, a, a King Records Japan pressing, which are quite often my go-to's as I'm sort of living here in Japan so they're quite quite easy to pick up but don't be afraid of this record uh, it's quite something it's a real trip uh, maybe for me because I sort of grew up listening to a lot of sort of noisy music it wasn't wasn't sort of a big deal for me but uh, I know people do find it a bit a bit tricky to sort of get their ears around but uh, top recommendation uh, one of the best free jazz records of all time Eric Dolphy out to lunch now the next bloke as well there's a whole stack of records of, of his that I could have chosen on Blue Note but I decided uh, to go with this one from 1968 Bobby Hutchison as a leader and his record entitled Stick Up and uh, I think what was it what's interesting about this yeah he had uh, Billy Higgins on the drums on this one instead of the usual, uh, his usual drummer, uh, Joe Chambers. McCoy Tyner on piano and Herbie Lewis on the bass. Six songs, all, five of them uh, sort of self-composed, Bobby's own compositions. Bobby Hutchison, it sort of fascinates me really because the vibes, I mean, I mean, you know, it's quite incredible the sort of atmosphere, atmospheres and moods and tones and textures that he sort of conjures up with his work on the vibes. Not only his records as a leader, but so many records sort of on Blue Note uh, uh, sort of really enhanced uh, incredibly by Bobby Hutchison's vibe. So any of his Blue Note records, are worth checking out but for today I've decided to have a to sort of show stick up from 1968 this record is one year younger than me now next this is probably one of the best records on Blue Note um, possibly one of the best jazz records of all time it's got a bright pink cover and the leader plays the trombone. Yes, of course, I'm talking about this absolute masterpiece of a record. Evolution, Gresham Moncur the third, and uh, this is sort of a dark, mysterious record. Moves at a slow pace. It could be sort of a sort of a movie soundtrack, almost quite eerie. Uh, it's really atmospheric. It's absolutely incredible. Again, Bobby Hutchison on the vibes. Jackie McLean, one of my sort of all-time favourites. I could have sort of shown about a whole stack of his records. So I've got one. You'll see that uh, later. But I love these kind of records that when you sort of look at the back, um, four songs, all self-composed. I really like that. Uh, and instead of sort of... Um, you know, standards or whatever. I think uh, that's sort of quite important to me. Anthony Williams, the young Anthony, Anthony Williams on the drums. 
and uh, of course this even has Lee Morgan on it too but honestly this if you haven't heard this record I mean if you're sort of like jazz and you and you like Blue Note you've, you've sort of almost definitely heard this record but if you haven't and even even if you sort of think that you're not a jazz fan I think you might enjoy this record it's really a masterpiece Evolution Gresham Moncur the third from 19 63 masterpiece next one of my favorite drummers one of my favorite jazz drummers he is an absolute beast behind the kit isn't he and most of his all of his blue note records come right at the tail end of the 60s and into the 70s when quite a difficult time really uh for jazz wasn't it at this time but uh for me this is his best record on Blue Note, of course, I'm talking about Elvin Jones and Coalition, and it's got his, uh, it's got his wife, Japanese wife, Keiko there, on the cover again. Just four tracks or five, sorry. Uh, my favourite is uh, uh, Shinji Shinji Two, uh, the lead off track again. Uh, a lot of sort of polyrhythms, maybe some sort of African influences uh going on on this record but uh yeah for me uh this is one of me this is sort of the best uh of his blue Note record it's got uh candido on the congas and frank foster uh on the sax bass clarinet alto sax and tenor sax they did a lot of stuff together didn't they uh elvin jones and frank foster this is the uh, sort of latest uh, record for me, this 1970. Uh, this came out, as I said, sort of quite a strange or difficult time for jazz. A lot of fusion stuff going on, wasn't there? But that is a hard hitting record. Next, one of my favorite artists on Blue Note. Again, I could have chosen the whole stack, and I know for sure people are gonna be like, Oh, why did he choose this one? Uh, not that one, but I went with this one. Uh, so don't shout at me, but Andrew Hill, Judgment. What an absolutely incredible uh, composer Andrew Hill was, wasn't he? Now, all his Blue Note records are absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely fantastic. Again, uh, Bobby Hutchinson on the vibe, Richard Davis on the bass, and Elvin Jones on the drums. Again, you look at the back, six compositions, all composed by Andrew Hill. I love that. And uh, I know I could have gone for Black Fire or Components or a whole bunch of others. I'll have a look at them another day. But uh, actually, there's fun I chose this one. It's sort of funny reason. There's a Japanese uh, sort of hardcore punk band that I'm a big fan of, and they're called Judgment. So every time I see this record, it sort of reminds me of Judgment. But this is a, a hornless session, isn't it? Uh, piano vibes, bass, and drums. Quite unique. Quite like that. But um, as I said, any any of Andrew Hill's records on Blue Note are masterpieces. A classic from 1964. Well, we're getting through these, aren't we? Again, next one of my favourite composers. Probably the yeah, definitely, perhaps my most favorite composer on blue note or in just in jazz in general called something about mr wayne shorter who's still alive isn't he alive and kicking just put out a new record just last year i haven't heard it yet uh, again amazing i love the artwork on this is a sort of dark record and this that's i mean speak no evil first song's called witch hunt and it's God, I mean, that's the song titles. Dance, Cadaver, Speak No Evil, Fee Fi Fo Farm, Wildflower, Witch Hunt, all composed by Wayne Shorter. I love, he's sort of got a lot of dark sounding uh, song titles and schizophrenia and stuff like that. And uh, really sort of dark, dark record, but uh, very melodic at the same time. Of course, oh, yes, his wife, Teruko, on the cover. Sort of Elvin Jones had his uh, Japanese wife on the cover too, didn't he? Speak No Evil, Wayne Shorter, absolute masterpiece from 
1966. Now, the next one, he sort of gets a lot of the same words uh, spoken about him as uh, Eric Dolphy uh, does on Out to Lunch. A piano player leaves blood all over the keyboard. Absolutely raging piano player. And I didn't choose the one that you might have thought I was going to choose. Of course, I'm talking about Cecil Taylor, the absolutely incredible Cecil Taylor and Conquistador, which for my money is a little bit more uh, listenable uh, than uh, unit structures, which is a cacophonous record. Well, this is a cacophonous record to two songs, uh, the title track and with exit, both about 19 minutes long. It's got Jimmy Lyons on the sax, Fiery Plat, Andrew Cyril, beast of a drummer, and then two two bass players, two heavy, heavy duty bass players, Henry Grimes and Alan Silver. So if you're a little bit afraid, a little bit afraid of unit structures and you've sort of heard things about that, give this one a listen first it is quite a journey mark my words it's a masterpiece in my opinion uh, Cecil Taylor from 1967 the year of my birth we're the same age but I think this record is probably in a little bit better condition than me okay we've got three more to go again Another one of my favourites uh, players, but uh, this guy, I like uh, his milestones recordings. Maybe more a bit controversial to say that than his Blue Note records. Of course, he was uh, did a lot of records on Blue Note. This is one of the later ones uh, from 1970, but it didn't come out until 1970. And uh, the thing about this, that I that I really like. It's got Alice Coltrane uh, plays on this record, doesn't she? And uh, this one sort of I've got a sort of a lot of um, sort of African uh, influences, polyrhythms, and uh, at, at the bottom it says, "I would like to dedicate this record to the late Lee Morgan uh, for the respect McCoy Tyner had for the man and for his family." That was written by. Uh, Andre Perry, our uh, music director from Howard University. But Wayne Shorter also plays on this. Alice Coltrane, Gary Bart, another one of my favourites. Uh, Ron Carter and Elvin Jones. Again, so many records of McCoy Tyner I could have picked out, but I sort of decided to go for this one. Maybe a bit sort of overlooked in his Blue Note discography masterpiece. Extensions, McCoy, Tyner, what a player. Well, we're down to two more, and I'm quite proud of this one. Not only is it one of my favorite records, I've said that about three times now, but it's also one of only a couple of sort of proper, real Blue Note originals. This is an Asteria original uh, from 1965. Pete LaRocca, drummer, I think he only put out you only, yes, one LP for Blue Note. He retired from jazz soon after, sort of became a lawyer. But uh, this is sort of a slow burning record with those sort of um, a lot of Middle Eastern uh, sort of rhythms and vibes going through it again. And it's really listenable. It's sort of melodic, but a little bit dark, as I said, sort of. Uh, Middle Eastern vibes, Joe and Joe Henderson on the sax, Steve Swallow on the bass, and um, Pete LaRocca, of course, the leader on the drum. Amazing, he was quite young, wasn't he, when uh, he put this out? And uh, sort of a shame, really. He only put out uh, the one record on Blue Note, but uh, he certainly left his mark. I know, I know, this record is a lot of people's favourites, uh, one of people's favourite. But if you haven't heard it, do give it a listen. It is a masterpiece. Pete LaRocca, Basra from 1965. Now, 
We've got one more to go, and he's one of my favourite horn players. Uh, well, certainly is his Blue Note uh, years, and there's a whole stack. I've got most of them. I'm missing, I'm missing one of them. It's sort of annoying me a little bit. I can't find it. Uh, Demon's Dance, I can't find it. Hopefully this year uh, I'll be able to track a copy of that down. But the one I've chosen to sort of uh, show by Jackie McLean is this one, Bout Soul. Now, why did I choose this one? Well, I, I sort of, when I bought this, I almost didn't buy it because Bout Soul and the cover, it sort of looks, I don't know, it looks like a sort of really typical uh, soul jazz record, record from the era, which I don't mind, but I already sort of have a lot of sort of Donald Bird records and, and this, that, and the other side. Uh, Lou, uh, Lou Donaldson so I sort of thought well maybe I don't really sort of need this one I don't really need too much more uh, soul jazz in my collection but I hadn't sort of seen it show up very often so I thought I'll lay down the sort of $10, 1000 yen whatever it cost for it and whoa was I surprised well of course I should have sort of been given a hint by looking at the liner from the back Woody Shaw Grasham Moncur the third, Jack and Clean of course, Lamont, Lamont Johnson, Scotty Holt, Rashid Ali on the drums, and Barbara Simmons on sort of vocals. She does this sort of beat, this sort of poetry uh, uh, at the beginning of the record. This is probably the most out, the most avant-garde of all Jackie McLean's Blue Note records. You wouldn't think so, would you, to look at the cover? So I was sort of don't always be sort of fooled or, or misled by a cover because this is a really challenging uh, record and definitely uh, Jackie McLean's most free and avant-garde record on Blue Note. Masterpiece, I could have chosen so many more but I thought it would be interesting to have a look at that one from 1969. Well, that's all for me today. Just sort of touched not even the tip of the iceberg with Blue Note. So maybe I'm going to do a volume two. If you have any suggestions, do let me know. So until next time, stay healthy and stay clean.